Welcome to the Legal Briefs Podcast. I'm Eric Kuhn. Today, we're with Anne-Marie Schubert, a career prosecutor with 29 years of law enforcement experience. She's currently a Sacramento, California prosecutor with a passion for DNA evidence and its role in solving cold cases. As founder of her office's Cold Case Prosecution Unit, she's known across the U.S. and beyond for her success using investigative genetic genealogy, which we'll call IgG. Anne-Marie and her team take credit for being the first law enforcement entity to successfully use IgG. She's a confirmed DNA detective at the forefront of using science and law enforcement to solve crime. Welcome, Anne-Marie. Thanks for having me, Eric. I really appreciate it. You and your team of prosecutors in Sacramento were the first to successfully use investigative genetic genealogy, or IgG, in 2018 to crack a 40-year-old case. But before we get into that, for those of us not familiar with IgG, give us the main points about how it works. Let me first start off by saying is that, yes, the Golden State Killer, who's charged now in Sacramento, it was a statewide effort for many, many years, and it wasn't just Sacramento that was involved. There was other folks along the way as well. So I want to make sure everybody gets the due credit, which includes the FBI and folks like Paul Holes. Just in general, the general concept of investigative genetic genealogy is, first of all, it's an investigative lead. So when you have a case that has biological material, say it's maybe blood from a scene that the bad guy left behind, you know, there's traditional ways that law enforcement tries to solve that. And that could be through entering it into the state convicted offender database. It's called CODIS. You could also do in some states in this country, we have what's called familial searching. That's done by a public laboratory. It's not the same as genetic genealogy because it's limited to very, very close relatives. That's called familial searching. If law enforcement essentially exhausts leads on that, then the next step would be now that we know this tool is available to try to do this concept of investigative genetic genealogy, which means that you have your DNA sample from the suspect. You send that sample out to a laboratory to have what's called SNP testing. It gets into the weeds, but much, much more information can be gleaned from that testing. And once that testing is done, then you can put that information, I guess you could say, into a publicly available genealogy site. And so those genealogy sites, people put their profiles into there because they want to find relatives. And it could be distant relatives. It could be somebody you never, ever in your life even knew you were related to. And so that's essentially the same concept is what law enforcement does is exactly the same that anybody other person that wants to get what we call a family matching report. They want to find out who are you related to. And so the same is true for these kinds of criminal cases, violent crimes, homicides, and sexual assault. So then essentially that's uploaded. You don't get anybody's profile back from that, but you get kind of potentially this family matching. Who may you be related to? Who may the bad guy be related to? And from there, law enforcement then has to do the really hard work sometimes of what we call building those family trees, just like anybody else would do in a genealogy site is trying to figure out who is this suspect related to. And it all depends on how much DNA your suspect shares with folks that are in that genealogy site. So that's like a lead. It may lead you to somebody after you've built those trees and then traditional law enforcement then takes over again and you then have to get another DNA sample from that suspect and do a one-to-one comparison to your crime scene. As I mentioned, that case that you and your team and colleagues across California and beyond took credit for was really the first successful case to use IgG to solve what was called the East Area Rapist or Golden State Killer case in 2018. Is it possible for you to put into context what kind of breakthrough that case represented for prosecutors, criminal justice? I mean, obviously that case, you know, had a 40-year history. It's pending in Sacramento, so I can't really talk about the specifics, but it's common knowledge that the case was investigated by many, many people across the state. But let's just take, you know, another case that might be the similar situation. I consider genetic genealogy to be revolutionary. It has the ability and has already demonstrated the ability to solve cases that would never have been solved. And so when you look since that time, we know that upwards of 70 cases across this country have now had arrests, some of which have resulted already in convictions. And I can guarantee you these people would never have been caught if it weren't for this new technology. I mean, these are individuals that have been arrested and or convicted already, really many of them living right amongst us. It is revolutionary. 
I find it exciting. I also am very, very mindful that there is privacy concerns that people have raised. And so we in this field, as a policymaker, we want to make sure that we all recognize the privacy interests, but we also appropriately balance those interests against public safety. You know, I think to a lot of people, it seems so simple. Of course, we've heard about DNA. I think your case was actually announced on National DNA Day. Yeah. (laughs) People are familiar with this now. But aside from it seeming kind of simple now that we know what you're capable of doing, can you recall where you were, you know, what time of day it was when you had that eureka moment that told you, <laughs> that told you IgG had effectively solved this case for you? When the idea was proposed to me, this is a new idea, can we try this? I mean, I, I'm a believer that DNA is the greatest tool ever given to law enforcement to find the truth, no matter what that truth is. I'm also a believer that we have to use this tool of DNA to the best of our ability because we want to make sure the right people are arrested. We want to make sure we exonerate people if they're not responsible, but we also want to identify people that are. And so the first time it was kind of presented to me, my, even though I understand DNA, I, I say to people, kind of my eyes glassed over because it was a little bit complicating to try to understand the science. And at one point during this kind of period when this was happening, I think I asked somebody, is this going to work? And the person responded to me was, it's our greatest hope. And so then once we got to that arrest, I mean, all I can really say is, I mean, it was a surreal moment for me. It was almost like, is this really happening? I was actually at a nonprofit dinner and I asked somebody in my office, you got to call me if something happens here. And so I got a call at a dinner and, you know, it was one of those moments I will never forget. Someone like, where were you when Elvis died? It's like one of those moments that you'll never forget because I think I said this at the press conferences, you know, a few days before all of this, I out of the blue got an email from one of the daughters of one of the murder victims and just basically said, you know, I have hope. I'm going to have hope. And I just said, keep the faith. We are looking for a needle in a haystack, but the needle's there somewhere. And so it was just almost serendipitous that all of that came together. And so it was a moment in time that I will not forget. And I have no doubt that the families that were, you know, victimized also, it was a moment in time for them. It seems almost like a Wright Brothers moment where you said, wow, this thing's really going to fly. But were there any hiccups or weak branches on what you call the genetic tree that you build? Every case is different. And it is completely dependent upon the information some, quote, relative has put their DNA in a genealogy site. And sometimes there's funky things that go on with families. We all know that when you put your DNA in a genealogy site, the company's going to tell you, you might find out information that you weren't sure of or didn't know, or it might be upsetting. So sometimes you might have cases where maybe there was an affair, maybe there was an adoption, maybe there was a child out of wedlock, maybe somebody is a closer relationship than you think that they really are. So there's always going to be, you know, every case is different. It's no different than your traditional law enforcement. Every case brings a different set of facts. And I'm not a genealogist, but the folks that have become very proficient at this, they, you have to just be ready to, to react to whatever it is and you learn and you become more expertise on it. And, you know, you do what you can to provide the answers that we're looking for. What kind of responsibility do you feel at this point to make sure IgG is used properly? I guess you could say I feel tremendous responsibility, but I also accept that responsibility because I realize that this is new. Even a year and a half later, it's still new. It's a field that is really not regulated. I mean, in truth, it's not regulated by the government, really. These are private companies. I recognize that we need to be mindful of that. And so well over a year ago, not long after the arrest on that case, many prosecutors across California that have expertise in DNA, we all felt strongly, listen, we should adopt a best practice model. And so we've spent a lot of time on what does that look like? How should we do this? One of the key components is don't do genetic genealogy on a nonviolent crime. We feel strongly that These should be used in cases that involve violent crimes such as rape or homicide. And, you know, there are many cases across this country that can benefit from this technology. Since the time myself, District Attorney Greg Totten, DA from Los Angeles, have really trained folks across the country and to some extent outside of this country on what is that best practice. Because we want to make sure that people follow that so that this incredible tool that we've now hopefully developed 
is used appropriately and that we are mindful of people's privacy rights. And I think we do quite a job on that. Evidently, the Department of Justice just released its interim policy on IgG. Any thoughts on that in any more detail aside from applicability to nonviolent crimes and stuff like that? I know the DOJ has invited the public to weigh in. Are you preparing any formal comments for the DOJ and what might they look like? Several of us that are kind of, I would say, in the trenches doing this kind of work have reviewed the policy, the interim policy, and our hope is to, you know, have a meaningful conversation with the folks at the U.S. DOJ and hopefully give our input on that. So there's a lot of that to that policy. I don't necessarily want to get into the weeds of it, but many of the things that they've adopted are are similar to what we believe, which would be things like, you know, let's use it on violent crimes and those kinds of things, but something that's still kind of in the works, I would say. You'd say, uh, in general terms, they're off to a good start then with the interim policy. It's a new and evolving field. That's about probably what I would say is, and I'm hopeful that by meeting with them and talking to them, that they'll understand kind of the boots on the ground, practical application of some of this work, so we can hopefully build a robust guidelines for folks that really appropriately balances the privacy and public safety aspects to it. We know that the National District Attorneys Association supports facial recognition, for example, as a tool for law enforcement. Right. In the bigger picture, does IgG fall into that same category now where the benefits of this new technology warrant careful reconsideration of some Fourth Amendment protections? Like any new tool that law enforcement has, we have to be mindful. Listen, we we all know that we're evolving as a society in a digital age. The amount of data that's out there in the domain is really astronomical. What I would say about IgG, and and someone said this to me once, this tool has the ability not only to solve crime, but to prevent crime and to exonerate people efficiently, fairly, and quickly. And that really, I mean that in the sense of, yes, we've seen many, many cases that have been solved. But when you look at some of the cases, for instance, there's a case out of Pennsylvania where the individual a uh, young lady named Christy Murak was brutally raped and murdered in the early 90s. And I'm sure they worked diligently to solve that. Ultimately, genetic genealogy identified the person. And it was somebody that lived right amongst them. I heard about a documentary done on that. And there was some impression that the person that found her was kind of under that cloud of suspicion. And that's one thing about cold cases is that oftentimes, or even not even cold cases, even active cases, you know, there's whispers. People think, oh, maybe that guy did it or this guy did it. And so with this genetic genealogy, the ability of law enforcement to quickly identify folks not only helps identify people, but also, you know, takes those clouds off of folks that didn't deserve it. And then if we're able to identify and arrest and prosecute quickly, there may come a day if we have this tool available and sufficient number of people are in these genealogy sites that we don't, we can eliminate that word serial. You know, and that's, somebody said that to me once, and I'm like, that's, I mean, imagine if we were able to stop a rapist before he becomes a serial rapist, or stop a murderer before he becomes a serial murderer. And so we're not only solving crime, prosecuting crime, preventing crime, but we're also exonerating folks that really had clouds of suspicion under them. So it's a tremendous opportunity for us to help better protect the public. You mentioned sufficient numbers. Latest statistics I've seen put the number of unsolved murders in the U.S. since 1960 at 200,000. How many can we realistically expect IgG to solve, or is the past the past? The past is not the past. I'm not surprised by that number of unsolved, but remember, it's, you know, this, this tool is dependent completely on our ability to have DNA. And that that was left behind. Now, one thing I would say is that, I mean, first of all, I believe, no, it's not going to solve all crime. Unless you have a DNA profile from the suspect, it's not going to solve that case. But, you know, in California, in every state in this country, we have a DNA data bank where officers, law enforcement can upload or have their, the lab upload forensic profiles that come from those crime scenes. So we know there's thousands of unsolved cases out there that have DNA profiles across the country. Will everyone be solved with IgG? No. But is there tremendous potential? Absolutely. No question about that we have this ability. And I don't want to give false hope to people, but we already know from this the last year, year and a half, that there are many, many cases that folks have lost hope on that now have regenerated hope for others. 
but we owe it to these families, to the victims, to society to do everything we can with that DNA to the best of our ability. And we're also evolving as a society that with forensics that, you know, we can get profiles from smaller and smaller samples. You touched on earlier on the topic of responsibility and privacy. You've probably seen some of the recent questions about Verogen buying GEDmatch, one of the more popular genetic testing sites that is available to law enforcement. Verogen just stated it's going to protect against what it deems improper police search warrants to access some of its genealogical data. What are the odds of a battle ahead that might wind up including some of the bigger genetic testing players like 23andMe or Ancestry.com? You know, will it end up in court? Maybe. I mean, I, you know, the reality is, I'm just going to give you some statistics similar to what you said, is, you know, every year in this country, over 300,000 women are sexually assaulted. We are very good in this country of now of recognizing the importance of investigating those and collecting the evidence. We've had these massive programs to, quote, end the backlog of rape kits, which we should do. We should end that backlog. But if we cannot solve that rape with our traditional avenues that we've had, we do owe it to this, our society to take the next step. And so I look at this as really an opportunity to have an impact on human rights. And so when we have some companies, you know, whatever, I'm not going to name any of them, that say basically we are not going to work with law enforcement. Well, I find that disappointing because shouldn't we as a society do everything we can to at least sit down and have a conversation about appropriately balancing those things? Do I think there'll come a day when the battle ends up in a courtroom? Yeah, I do think that may happen. But we're going to do what we believe we can lawfully do, whether it's by a court order or a search warrant, and let a judge decide if that's necessary. I mean, I think when the Facebook stuff came out, when law enforcement was, you know, doing search warrants on Facebook, there might have been some angst at that moment in time. Um, the same thing with cell phone records. But the fact is that we're not looking for the car burglar. We're looking for the rapist and we're looking for the murderer or the violent crimes, as I mentioned. So, you know, if somebody decides, you know, tomorrow to leave a bunch of bombs somewhere along a race route and, and the bomb blows up, shouldn't we use every skill that we have or every tool that we have appropriately? And so maybe there may come a fight someday, and we're going to do in public safety what we believe we need to do to make sure that we remedy that situation and we'll address it at the right time. Well, clearly we're at the forefront of science and law enforcement marrying up and providing fascinating new techniques and tools to help you in your work. Given what you've learned so far in working with all of your colleagues across different law enforcement agencies, what are some key insights or counsel you'd share with other prosecutors based on what you know at this point? I would share kind of the same stuff that I think we try to share when we train. One is understand how it works. Because it's not simple. It may seem simple, it's not. But more importantly, understand that we should follow a best practice model because we want to make sure that we are cognizant that this is a new and emerging area and we do have an obligation to protect people's privacy. There's interesting debates about genealogy sites because many adoptees go into these sites because they want to find their biological parents. Well, that creates privacy interests because the biological parent may have thought their privacy was going to be protected forever, and now that may not be the case. I'm not saying that's good or bad. I'm just saying these privacy interests are not just unique to law enforcement trying to access these sites. They are implicated when you're talking about adoptees. They're implicated when you're talking about children that are the product of sperm donors. And so we have to be mindful of that. And we've also got other parts of it where, you know, the genealogy sites may be selling people's data to drug companies. And I'm not saying that's good or bad because we all want to cure cancer, but there are privacy implications, but they're not unique to law enforcement. And we have to all be willing to recognize that and not just pin it on law enforcement that they're trying to do something bad because quite frankly, what they're trying to do is solve violent crime. Thank you, Anne-Marie, for your work. We look forward to following the legal justice system as it continues to innovate for the future. Thank you so much for having me, Eric. I really appreciate it. Thank you for listening. This podcast is a production of the National District Attorneys Association. If you have comments or a question, please visit 
ndaa.org forward slash contact. That's ndaa.org forward slash contact. I'm Eric Kuhn. Until the next time.